Welcome. I'm glad to see so many of you at our event today with Liel Lipovitz, the author of Stan Lee, A Life in Comics. I'm Rachel Gordon, and I teach in the Department of Religion and the Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Florida. Um, I'm delighted to see in our crowd today so many undergraduates. Since we have you here, I just want to let folks know that the Center for Jewish Studies has undergraduate writing awards that you might want to keep in mind as you're writing your end of semester papers. The deadline is not until May, but you can submit in December if you have papers from the semester that include Jewish content. I also want to mention that we hope to see many of you at one of our very few in-person events next week. This is Thursday, November 18th at 5 p.m. We're having um, Shaul Magid from Dartmouth speak about his new book. Uh, and now to present our guest, um, Liel Leibovitz is a senior writer for Tablet Magazine and a host of the Unorthodox podcast. Um, and as I mentioned, he's the author of a recent book about Stan Lee that is published as part of the Yale University Press Jewish Live series. During today's event, we will have plenty of time for your questions and comments, so please feel free to put those in the Q&A section at any time during the event. Um, and I will try to make sure we get to those as many as possible since I'm moderating here. And because I realize with great power, there must also come great responsibility. Um, now, that's a line that, as many of you know, comes from one of Stan Lee's creations, Spider-Man. Uh, and it's also the kind of line that is an example of why I think it's hard for some of us who are more outsiders to comic books to understand what the what all the big deal is about, um, because that line doesn't seem like the most original statement. Um, and as our guest, Liel, has written, it's a sentiment that was, in fact, expressed by many other great historical figures like Churchill, like Jesus, like uh, President uh, Roosevelt. Um, but Liel writes, uh, it would quote, it was Lee's, that's Stan Lee's, introduction of the sentiment that stuck and would go on to become a staple of American culture. I'm paraphrasing uh, Liel here a little bit here, but Liel writes that this, this idea was quoted by Obama and Justice Alana Kagan, and it resonated because unlike its predecessors, it was not uttered by the mighty as a reminder of noblesse oblige, but by an everyman trying to figure out the foundation of moral behavior. Spider-Man was a young man learning how to be human. So to me, this is an example of how um, Liel makes clear some of the, the power of, of comics. Um, I, I wonder, Liel, if you could talk to us a bit about this sort of, um, I don't know, this, this confusing thing of, of why, why comic books like that, that Lee was behind ended up being so powerful and meaningful, even though sometimes on the face of it, it har it's hard to tell what, what all the hype is about. Uh, with pleasure. Thank you, first of all, so much for having me. I, I am delighted to be here, although like every New Yorker, I, I wish I was in Florida in person. You guys have already made you know, good life choices, so good for you. Uh, and I do hope that we would get to, to nerd out uh, in the Q&A later. Why comic books? Uh, why Stan Lee? These are huge questions, uh, and, and I, I want to try and answer them in, in this way. Um, the short, short, short answer is because they were so not respectable, because there was something about them that, that was so crass and base and cheap and uh, free of any aspirations of high culture and sophistication that really allowed for real sort of exploration of ideas. Famously, uh, the Stanley story begins, and I will say as a caveat for everything I'm about to say, Stanley was an inveterate, masterful, beautiful liar. Stanley has fabricated almost every aspect of his life uh, gleefully, joyfully, you know, outwardly. And so writing a biography, I really had two choices here. You know, one uh, is to kind of try to chase the dragon 
and figure out what's truth and what fiction, which struck me as, as, as very pedantic and a little bit boring. And the second is kind of to try to make sense of the, of the larger element of what goes on. So here's Stanley. Uh, he's a man in his 40s. Uh, he's worked in comic books uh, his entire life. He hated them. Uh, he hated this industry. He thought it was very stupid. He never read them uh, as a child. He read some comic strips, but mainly Shakespeare and Dickens uh, and, you know, Twain and, and, you know, really had aspirations of one day writing the great American novel. Uh, he had toiled away in this industry for 20 something years since he was a very young man. Um, he really didn't like anything about it. He thought it was sort of, you know, profoundly idiotic. Uh, and he, at that point in his life, a father, a married man, middle-aged man, uh, he came home one day uh, and told his wife, you know, I'm going I'm, I'm to quit. I can't do this anymore because this is really a terrible medium to work in. And his wife, Joni, God bless her soul, said, you know, if you're going to quit, you should at least do one comic book the way you always wanted to. What do you care? Like, you can't get, if you get fired, this, you know, what do you want to achieve anyway? And so he sat down and he thought to himself, okay, what is it? that I hated uh, about comic books. And more importantly, what is it that I think this medium actually has the opportunity or the potential of doing? Uh, and, and then he started riffing. I will say very much so with his creative partner and a man I also deeply admire uh, and a man every bit as responsible for Marvel success as Stan Lee, who is the, the, uh, the artist, Jack Kirby. Um, so first of all, he thought there was a problem with how superheroes uh, were were sort of represented on the scene. Superheroes uh, came to us courtesy of DC Comics, um, creators of Batman, Superman, uh, Wonder Woman, etc. And even though most of these uh, comic books and, and characters were created by Jews, I'm sorry, my neck is in a state. Even though most of these comic books were created by Jews, um, they were actual embodiments of two major, very Christian theological staples that dominated most of American religious and cultural life for centuries. Um, on the one hand, the sort of fundamentalist streak, this is what Gary Wills calls the, the head and the heart. On the one hand, the heart, the fundamentalist streak. Uh, if you think of the Scopes monkey trial, you know, obviously the, the side of William Jennings Bryan. Uh, this is Superman, uh, the Christ-like figure coming from a different uh, planet uh, descending here on earth to save us uh, from, from uh, ourselves and to clear us of our sins, his hands off into the side in a, in a savior-like position. Uh, and in comic book after comic book, he figuratively, if not literally, dies for our sins. And, and he's also indestructible, which makes him this fantastic uh, creature from, from another realm. And then the other, the head, the side of rationality, of science, of progress, Batman, uh, a man endowed with no special powers except for uh, the accident of his birth, great wealth, and uh, you know, a, a, an iron will to use technology and its best tools to fight crime. And these Jewish comic book creators uh, rode around these two poles, uh, which again are, are two very kind of Christian concepts. Stanley, being although he very rarely spoke about it and spoke about it in all kinds of um, convoluted <laughs> roundabout ways. Um, Stanley was a Jew, and he wanted a comic book world, a pantheon that reflected Jewish theological sensibilities. He wanted heroes that were fallible, that fought, that did not agree uh, on, on the great concept of, of, of the good uh, and the right. He wanted a, a, a collection of people who felt much more like the rabbis we read in the Talmud who argue incessantly and who possess great, great, you know, capacity for miraculous feats, uh, but sometimes can't stand each other and sometimes are, are locked in bitter, bitter feuds because the things that they fight about uh, matter a lot. So, so Stan Lee gave, uh, gave a kind of birth to, to these sensibilities. He created the Fantastic Four. Uh, this is 1963, giving the world really something uh, or 1962, I'm sorry, giving the world something that, that we have never seen before, something that felt much more rooted in reality, that the cities that he wrote about weren't Gotham or, you know, all, all, these, all these kind of made up uh, cities, but it was New York. It was recognizable. It was the here and the now. It rooted the, the, the divine uh, in the earthly and made it uh, clear that sometimes the distinctions and the uh, barriers between them were, were blurred. 
Uh, and that gave such an incredible charge to, to fans because all of a sudden there was this free and cheap and available uh, medium uh, through which to ask really big, big, big questions without seeming heavy, without the moderation of the expert class uh, in a way that was fun and free. And um, for decades to come, comic books remain the medium we turn to uh, often to address very big uh, political and socioeconomic questions. Stanley and Marvel uh, famously were very, very quick to address a lot of the you know, social political upheavals of the 60s, uh, medium that we turn to to ask big philosophical questions. There's a tremendous um, graphic novel called um, Red Sun, which imagines what might have happened if Superman's father um, Jor-El waited just another second before sending his son to Earth. And because of the revolution of the planet, instead of landing in Kansas, he landed in the Ukraine and became one of Stalin's, you know, secret tools and, and you know, granted uh, victory to communists. It became this great medium to have free and unfettered exploration of ideas. Uh, to an extent, it's kind of no longer that. It is big business, big entertainment now. But for, for several decades, uh, it really shaped uh, a lot of the way we interact with, with ideas. Um, yeah, that it, it reminds me of a, a part in the book. Um, you write that you, you're comparing comic books to, to rock and roll. They're both of them being popular art, popular art forms in the 60s. Um, and you write that both were in the true tradition of indigenous American art, passionately dedicated to merry theft of concepts, of backbeats, of aesthetics, and both inhaled deeply in the fumes of influence, making them ideal instruments for processing anxieties in real time. Um, just to give a, our I listeners- I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> and in fact, you did. Um, but I want to give our, our listeners, not all who've had a chance to read your book yet, a taste of your writing, um, which is a very thought provoking. Um, but it, it, it seems like you're, you're kind of acknowledging there might be times that are more ripe for comics, um, for this kind of processing of the gestalt. And I, I wonder if we're in one of those times now or well, we're, we're sort of at a really mm -hmm. weird time. First of all, I, I completely agree. I, I think, I think comic books, um, do best, uh, at a time where 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 institutions do worse, uh, mm -hmm. I, I mentioned rock and roll in this quote. Uh, the reason I did it is I feel that uh, what American popular culture has, um, sorry, my, my phone is thinking. Let me silence it. Uh, what American popular culture does uh, does absolutely uh, miraculously well, better better than than any other uh, kind of. I think ex other comparable national example is really capture these um, these spiritual yearnings, uh, as Leonard Cohen sang, the spiritual thirst uh, that that this this you know deeply devout uh, nation with its with its kind of you know deeply religious origins has, uh, and and translating this um, into into storylines uh, into into creations uh, that are that are massively popular. Uh, once those spirits escape the pews of churches, synagogues, mosques, and other houses of worship, once people um, stop uh, kind of equating the religious experience with the sort of traditional, organized, uh, streamlined kind of experience that they have um, in, in, in their traditional faith communities, uh, there arose a need to deal with the same with the same hankerings, with the same yearnings. Uh, and because uh, it's, look, it's, it's like the laws of physics, right? This energy is never squandered. It never goes away. We still have those same existential questions. We still have that same spiritual uh, uh, thirst. And if we don't slake it uh, with our priest or our rabbi or our imam, then we need another source. Uh, in mm -hmm. comes rock and roll which uh, talks about things like breaking on through to the other side uh, that gives us these ecstatic moments of, of worship together in, in a, in a right-like setting, right? Moving and dancing and, and, and singing. Uh, in comes uh, not so much literature, which at that point is already enshrined in of itself, or academia, which is already enshrined as an institution, but, but things that feel cheap and free and out of control, comic books, at that time, first and foremost. So it's not a coincidence that the 60s gave us comic books, which brings us to now. 
I think part of the reason why uh, Marvel, the Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, thrived uh, at, at this exact moment in time, and, and bear in mind this, you know, nerds in, in the audience already know this, but there have been many other attempts um, earlier to translate uh, Stanley's creations into television shows, movies, cartoons. There have been many failed versions of anything and everything from the Incredible Hulk to the Silver Surfer, uh, Fantastic Four, and either some, some you know, Spider-Man uh, mis misfirings. The reason this, this, uh, this thrives now, the reason why it's so popular now is because we're once again, sadly, at, at a moment in time in American history in which our faith in institutions is declining, in which our ability to pursue these grand questions of what does it mean to be an American and what does it mean to be human and what does it mean to interact with, with other people, especially ones we may disagree with, uh, our ability to pursue these questions in traditional fashions through the classroom, through the boardroom, through the, the, the church room uh, are, are declining. Uh, and once again, we turn to, to our, our great uh, you know, street prophets uh, to, to answer these same questions. And, and this was Stan Lee's genius. Um, you know, speaking of Stan Lee's genius, in some ways, it, you know, on the one hand, there's the idea of the, the lonely artist who is maybe content to be behind the scenes. And then there's an artist like Stan Lee. Um, and it's hard to tell if that, um, that desire he eventually has to be at the, the forefront of his creations or to or at least make cameo appearances. Um, is that also because as you were saying before, he, he had other ambitions. He, I mean, it seems like if he were more of the comic book geek who had just wanted to write comics, that was my whole dream. Um, he would have been a, he would have been less kind of hungry for the spotlight than he seems to be. Um, which, which eventually also seems to have the effect of, um, changing the art form a bit too, as he makes himself the center of it, or not always the center, but he appears in it often. You're, you're hitting in something so profound uh, to, to the entire enterprise here, and so weird, because the first question that you have, uh, when not just when you're writing a biography of Stan Lee, but when you just start kind of figuring out uh, comic books and Marvel and, and, and this entire universe is, what does this guy actually do? <laughs> well, who's this guy? Does he actually draw the pretty pictures? Well, no. Great artists like you know Steve Ditko and Jack Kirby, uh, et cetera. I'm, I apologize. I have no idea how to silence my 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 phone, and this thing keeps dinging. So if you hear it in the background, apologies. Uh, he doesn't draw uh, the art. Uh, does he write the stories? Well, he kind of. Uh, but famously, he invented something called the Marvel method, in which he tells the artist, uh, because he wanted to create many of these and because he wanted to create many of these quickly, uh, because very frequently he was a one-man operation throughout most of his early career, uh, to kind of streamline things, he invented this method by which he would summon an artist, usually someone very young, sometimes really people who had zero experience and just walked in and said, I'd like to be an artist. And he said, fine, you're hired, come sit down. Uh, and he would tell him a story. And by a story, I mean he would tell him the most general, broad outlines of what he wanted to be in that story. And then the artist would go home and draw stuff. And then Stan Lee would just write words and, and dialogues and caption. Now, I'm not belittling his contribution, but very frequently, a lot of the other drama came from elsewhere. Most famously, one day uh, he's sitting uh, in his office and he receives the... the um, the, the page proofs that he received from, from Jack Kirby for, for one Fantastic Four Adventures. And right there in the middle of the frame uh, is a dude uh, made of silver in the sky on a freaking surfboard. Now, nothing about Stan Lee's instructions included a, a cosmic surfer silver guy in, in the stars. Uh, and I suppose another editor of Lesser Genius might have summoned Jack Kirby and fired him for being insubordinate. But Stanley looked at this and said, oh my God, look at this guy. We'll call him the Silver Surfer. Let's create a, a backstory for him. Uh, but, but that character was very much Jack Kirby's um, contribution. What Stan Lee knew how to do, uh, in addition to telling stories, in addition to selling Marvel as a, as a, um, as a, as a, as a, as a product, as a brand name, which is not the way uh, or the approach to marketing that a lot of people had back then in the 1960s. What his real genius was, uh, 
was almost in the this kind of like mytho poetic tradition of sitting by the campfire and and summoning the great big uh, uh, stories predicated on on the spirits of of the culture and and retelling these stories in ways that they could be engaged. The, the argument that I make uh, in in my book is that. Uh, Whereas he doesn't necessarily admit it, uh, whether it's not necessarily a clear cut uh, argument that you could empirically prove, but the stories Stan Lee tells in these comic books are very much the stories of the Hebrew Bible. They're the same classical dramas of, you know, brother versus brother of power and responsibility. Sometimes you could actually trace, you know, real storylines and, 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 and influences more clearly uh, than 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 others, uh, but by summoning these great big narratives that by now have been sort of forgotten, set to the wayside, affiliated with with unpopular things like religion, uh, and giving them new life, giving them new energy, giving them just one little twist. Not exactly writing, not exactly illustrating, not exactly editing, not exactly producing. Summoning, conjuring, like a wizard, right from from from. As, as, as the Hebrew said, like out of, out, of the, out of the mists of time, you conjure the story. Uh, that was incredibly powerful, which is why people started reacting to it very much and very early on, like a religion. They started following these storylines religiously and, and sought meaning in it, uh, moral instruction uh, that we used to go to you know, houses of worship for. That is a very considerable talent, and it's not one that's really easy to, to quantify, judge, or sometimes even understand, which is why throughout his life, uh, he was very frequently kind of dismissed as like, oh, this is just a self-promoter. This is just a guy who's good at talking. Well, I think he was, I think he was a lot more than that. Um, you know, in the 60s, as, as you note in the book, you know, he's, he's not the youngest, I'm, not that being in your 40s is old, but he, he starts getting invited to um, college campuses. And it, it sounds from the, the story you tell of this, it almost seems like he has to, he realizes he has to kind of reinvent himself. And I can't tell if he discovers he's more popular than he realized and he wants to, to fit the persona that, that his audience seems to expect of him or, or what that moment of, of becoming popular with the counterculture and, and the sort of younger folks in the 60s does for, for him and his ideas about his career. Well, I think they were incredibly seminal, not just for him and his career, but, but for us and our cultural trajectory. Um, you know, the 60s were, were these, this, this really uh, strange moment uh, in, in America, but also world history. Uh, here we are, you know, roughly a decade and a half uh, after, after World War II, and, uh, and, and most of life, again, throughout the West, uh, is sort of about, um, it's about pr prosperity, it's about uh, professionalism, it's about this kind of long march towards strong uh, foundations of, of sort of rootedness in, in, in a certain kind of economic uh, mode and, and national um, state of being. Um, and a lot of young people are, are feeling completely um, completely left out in the cold by that form of exploration because in universities and in popular culture and uh, in, you know, many other fronts, um, serious, big, uh, moral, philosophical questions uh, are simply not discussed anymore. You know, philosophy in universities has become this very kind of, um, at that point, a very kind of rigid pursuit that sees itself as a, a, a professional uh, a set of studies that is interested in kind of, you know, word games and, and logical uh, quizzes. Uh, and if fewer and fewer people go to church and if popular culture is more interested in commerce uh, and if everyone is seemingly more into their jobs than they are into, you know, kind of big social trends, then where do you go to actually ask the big questions, which is a young person, especially as a young person, you're, you're burning you off from the inside. What's the good life? What should I do with my life? What responsibility do I have towards other people? You know, what's, what's, what's politics and, and how should I be in the world? Um, and, and these young people, again, find uh, license and liberty to, to adjudicate these questions in Stanley's creations. And they turn to him, especially because he's a little bit older and by now has figured out that his age actually is, is a 
was an asset, not a liability. They turned to him for answers. And so he changes accordingly. And, and from, um, from a mere entertainer, from someone who just goes in and kind of like, you know, glad hands and, and sort of sells uh, his product, I think he really uh, makes a concerted effort to become a listener uh, and, mm-hmm. and to, to understand the role that he plays for these people and actually then transport their concerns and their energies into, uh, into the comic books. He starts a Stan's soapbox uh, uh, section of every comic book in which he, uh, he writes fairly straightforward political little essays, which may seem really, really strange, you know, because three pages later, the Green Goblin's, you know, riding a little, you know, jetpack and, and throwing little cherry bombs. Um, but, but Stan meant them very sincerely. He wanted to show his, his, his readers that he uh, was at the very least respecting their, their kind of moral, uh, political, uh, social engagements. The storylines, too, uh, you, you see racism, you see addiction, uh, you see war, you see all these great big questions come to the fore. And as the comic books progresses, uh, we were just talking, uh, apologies to all, but before all of you joined us, we were talking about how when you go back and, and read the first, um, you know, the, the, the kind of early um, Marvel comics, they're astonishingly um, uh, complex in their morality. Spider-Man, by issue two, uh, literally the very next move after great power comes great responsibility, which, which ends the first, the first comic book. By issue two, um, he goes to the Fantastic Four uh, and fights them as a sort of addition, uh, he hopes, to get into the group. And when they finally kind of you know, pin him down, he says, okay, can I be in the group now? And they say, why do you want to be in the group? And he says, well, because you're superheroes and you must make a lot of money. And I'm a superhero too. And I want to make a lot of money. And they say, we don't make a lot of money. We, this is altruistic. We do it to help other people. And he looks at him and says, really? You have all this power and you're not making money? He's genuinely kind of you know, grappling with the responsibilities of what this, this ability that he has actually means. It doesn't sort of just turn on for him as it does in the Marvel movies. Iron Man is for a very long time a sort of filthy Vietnam War profiteer who has far, far, far shadier moral kind of, you know, uh, uh, underpinnings than, than, than Tony Stark does, uh, played by Robert Downey Jr. In, in, in the movies. They really uh, allowed time and space to, to, to kind of wrestle with, with deep moral issues. Uh, and, and young readers appreciated this, and Stanley listening to them made this more and more and more of, of the focus of, of the comic books, which is why they're so astonishingly great. I mean, go back and read early X-Men comics. Like the question of morality uh, that they, or the questions of morality that they explore, I would argue are, are as profound and, and serious and demanding of us as any other work of philosophy written in that or any other period. Hmm. I mean, do you think Stanley um, saw himself in the kind of moralizing teaching? I need to give you the answer, or am I just laying out the questions and we're kind of playing with them? Uh, like, uh, like every artist uh, mm-hmm. worth her or his salt, uh, <laughs> he uh, escaped such generalizations uh, like the plague. You know, he learned from Dylan, uh, from Bob Dylan, very well. Uh, and he very often kind of, I don't want to say played the fool, but, but sort of uh, pretended like it had never actually occurred to him that his work was about anything other than, you know, fun guys in tights, um, which, which in part makes the task of a biographer <laughs> so incredibly frustrating because you want nothing more than to find this kind of smoking gun, right, um, that proves that here was the the thinker all along concerned with the plight of mankind. And so here I am, I'm reading and, and, and sort of plowing through, through all, through all this, this stuff. Um, and finally, I found something um, that, that plays a kind of remarkably small role uh, in, in the Stanley uh, hagiography, even though he's, he's such a public, popular figure. Uh, this is not something I, being an obsessive, had, had heard about before I started doing research. So um, by the early 70s, he is finally appointed uh, the kind of publisher of Marvel Comics. He'd uh, kind of uh, toiled under a, a host of, of uh, terrible, horrible bosses. Uh, and to fet him, because by now his creations are so popular, uh, his new corporate overlords uh, throw together a, an evening in Carnegie Hall. Uh, by all accounts, it was 
abysmal. Uh, it, he had circus uh, performers, he had uh, poets, he had all kinds of uh, a ragtag collection. It, it, the, the reviews were, were, were horrendous. But at the very end, they reserved 15 minutes for Stanley to do whatever he wanted. Uh, and he said he wasn't going to tell them what he was going to do. It was going to be a surprise. Uh, here's a man at the height of his career uh, on stage, Carnegie Hall, the entirety of, of New York's, you know, intelligentsia coming to see him. What will he do? Uh, how will this great, big, you know, glib, shallow, self-promoter, cool cat guy uh, pass the time? And here's what he did. He went up and he read a poem together with his wife and his daughter, uh, a very long poem called God Cried. Uh, and it is written from the perspective of God who looks at his creation, uh, mankind, looks at our moral failings, looks at uh, how cruel we can be to one another, looks at how we disrespect the spirit of, of divine love uh, in which the world was, was, was shaped. Uh, and, and, and his heart breaks. Uh, and it is such a, first of all, such a moving poem, but such a deeply kind of, you know, almost grim theological reflection from someone who for a decade insisted he was about nothing more than bang, pow, zoom, <coughs> that I think really, um, at the very least, goes some way, uh, if not a very long way, to support the argument that Stanley always understood very well what he was doing. It was always, uh, I don't want to say a, a moralizing quest, but it was always a deep philosophical exploration uh, tethered to, to Jewish tradition uh, and tethered to a, a sense of commitment to real world sociopolitical issues. That was really interesting hearing about, um, you know, Lee's motivations. It reminds me, I, I'd love for us to, to hear more about how you came to write this book and your your engagement with Stanley. Ah, so I was um, I was born in Israel. <coughs> Pardon me. I was born in Israel, and when I was seven years old, uh, my parents took me to this year in New York City for the first time um, to visit, and had the idea because they were searching for things to do with an annoying little kid. So you know, toy store, obviously Museum of Natural History to see the big blue whale. And my dad had the idea to take me to a famous comic book store called Forbidden Planet, which is still there, albeit not in the original location, but a few blocks away. And I walked in um, and, you know, the, the, the description, you know, kid in the candy store very much applies because I, I had never really seen comic books before, but I was an avid reader. Uh, there were not a lot of comic, there were not a lot of bookstores in Israel, period, at the time. Um, and so I was walking around looking at all these great, big, beautiful, illustrated uh, little booklets. Uh, and I wanted all of them. So I sort of haphazardly, literally sort of, you know, grabbed whatever I could find and, and, and took a, a stack of about 30 and brought them to my parents and made this, uh, in retrospect, completely idiotic uh, plea, telling them that they needed to buy all of this from me uh, because this is uh, how I learned the English good from the comic book. Basically saying, oh, this is educational. Buy this for me and I will learn. Uh, miraculously, they said, okay, makes sense. At least you're reading something. And so I bought these books and I, I brought them home um, to Israel. And because I knew there, there would not be a return trip, I mean, I can't, uh, I can't re-up my supply for quite a while. I, 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 I parsed them uh, like they were the Talmud. I read them so carefully uh, and, and really tried to find uh, you know, the deepest meaning in every panel because this was, you know, this was my entertainment for the year. Uh, and not knowing a lot about uh, the history of this medium, and uh, look at me, I'm ancient, so this is before the internet, you can just go and Google, you know, Marvel Comics, uh, even without knowing the whole history, even without knowing the differences, it, it, there was something very, very distinct about Marvel Comics uh, that felt to me long before I could define any of it or articulate any of it, that felt to me very Jewish. You know, there's this famous story from the Talmud um, about a bunch of rabbis having an argument. Um, and one of them, Rabbi Eliezer, says one thing and all the other rabbis said something else. And Rabbi Eliezer said, well, you know, if I'm right, uh, let this tree over there uh, get up and do a little dance. And the tree gets up and dances. And Rabbi Eliezer says, see? And the other rabbis say, that means nothing. It's just a tree dancing. A tree doesn't get to decide the Torah. And then he does the same thing with, with a, a, a stream of the river. And all kinds of miracles happen 
all suggesting that Rabbi Eliezer is right, and the rabbis are not impressed. Finally, Rabbi Eliezer said, if I am right, let God himself come and say so. And a voice comes from the heaven and says, Rabbi Eliezer is right. And the other rabbis look up and say, excuse me, maybe he's right up there in heaven, but down here on earth, we get to decide. And then the story ends by saying that God saw this and was delighted to see his children besting him. This spirit of, of, of contention between, between superpower and human frailty, uh, the sense of, 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 of in, ingoing, ongoing fight between great and mighty people who all work towards the same goal, but in very different ways. This sense that, that, that real progress comes not from progressing according to the wills of one strong, solitary hero like Jesus Christ, Superman, but by a group of people, by a real community, working together and resolving differences even, or especially if they can't really stand one another. That struck me as so deeply Jewish, so, so resonant with what I knew from my own reality and my own tradition. And it really deeply, deeply uh, moved me and made me a lifelong fan. Mm, um, that story there of how you, you first came to comic books reminds me in the, um, in the review that the Harvard Law School professor Cass Sunstein wrote of your book. Um, he also talked about, you know, this, this was what he was able to read as a kid and he wasn't much of a reader, but the comic books sort of made him a reader, which is another reminder of the, the positive um, of comic books, but, but also makes me think that, I mean, now, of course, I'm sure many young girls uh, read comic books too, but it seems like there was an era um, when it was more of a, a boy's thing um, and probably guided or shaped, you know, American boy culture a bit, or at least if you were an insider to this world. Um, so I, I will say that, that is so true. Two, two well, three things uh, make me as a sort of elder statesman of, of nerd dumb or nerdhood, mm -hmm. uh, a title which I claim for myself, uh, three things make me very, very happy. One, obviously, that they're so popular now. I, if you told me uh, when I was sitting by myself in a corner of school reading a comic book while everyone else was obsessing over sports, that one day knowledge of the intricate storylines of the Avengers would actually make me a cool person at a party, I would have, I would have burst out laughing. This is number one. Uh, that makes me very happy. Number two, it's exactly what you said. To see, uh, to see so many, um, so many women, uh, including my ten-year-old daughter, who's a huge comic book fan, um, come into what was what was traditionally a deeply, deeply kind of male stronghold, uh, and to see stories and characters uh, beginning to reflect that change in a major, major way. To see characters like Squirrel Girl. Uh, which is just so wonderful, or the, the recent very, very, very Jewish character in the DC universe, Whistle, uh, by E. Lockhart, who is a, a, a Jewish, uh, young Jewish woman activist whose superpower is being able to communicate with dogs, including a great Dane whose name is Leibowitz. Um, I love this, and it makes me very happy. The third thing that makes me very happy, and, and this is, you know, Stanley working this right into the DNA, uh, it was very important to him that these heroes be not uh, the perfectly chiseled uh, Bruce Wayne or the even more perfectly chiseled Clark Kent slash, you know, Kal-El Superman, uh, but, but little, little scrawny Peter Parker from Queens, who's obviously a stand-in for, you know, a, a Jewish guy from, 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 the, from the outer burbs, um, from the outer boroughs. Uh, that type of DNA uh, very, very much stayed, which is why I, I love the fact that the new iterations of these heroes are, you know, Miles Morales, are like a, a, a mixed race uh, African American Latino kid. Uh, we have superheroes now that are women wearing hijabs. We have the people who are now, uh, as as Jews and the people who, are, or let's say, as Jews who are back then a minority, still struggling to gain a, a sort of a, a foothold in in the culture at large. And you know, a lot of time has passed. It gives me a great pleasure to see that uh, minorities that are now going through the same challenges that American Jews went through 40, 50, 60 years ago are now the new face of, of superhero dumb, are now the new characters that are, that are living out these same stories. I think that's exactly what comic books are supposed to do, and that's exactly what Stan Lee wanted them to do. He wanted this to be a vehicle for, for people who are a little bit marginalized, a little bit on the outside, a little bit grappling 
uh, with with society's uh, approval uh, to to explore the possibilities of what it meant to be an American. I want to remind folks that um, we'd love to hear your thoughts and questions in the Q&A section. And I've got a question here from um, Maxine Donnelly, who says, thank you so much for a fantastic discussion. Do you think some comics or popular culture are still helping people ask the big questions? If not, where are people asking these questions? Uh, Maxine, that's an amazing question. Thank you. Uh, I, I love it, and, and, and I want to answer it very carefully uh, because my, my first inclination uh, is to, to be the sort of, you know, old man yelling at clouds uh, mode uh, and say that I actually think something, something I don't want to say terrible, but very challenging has happened to comic books as soon as something becomes big business, as soon as it becomes a huge corporate endeavor. And I'm not, you know, uh, some, some, some raving radical uh, but but when you have to sell you know a billion dollars worth of tickets on an opening weekend, your appetite uh, for for really 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 big questions uh, it diminishes significantly. I am you know uh, pretty ambivalent about the Marvel movies. Uh, I think that uh, some of them are fine entertainment, but for the most part, I feel like they lack the sort of uh, gritty openness to to larger uncomfortable. Uh, piercing, searing questions that the comic books had. Um, so, so I don't know about comic books anymore uh, because, again, uh, they had become very big business. There are a lot of great alternative comics doing amazing things. So I don't want to say that that the whole kind of genre has been decimated, but uh, with uh, with great success uh, comes comes great uh, hesitancy uh, to 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 innovate and and to do kind of cool groundbreaking stuff. Where does this kind of, of, of work happen? I, th I think it happens in, in, in a lot of other places. I think it happens in music, uh, which has now uh, kind of been blown open, allowing uh, so many other people into, into, the, into the mix that have never been able to join before. A kid like Billie Eilish could sit in her bedroom with a computer and compose amazing, amazing music and find her fans without uh, the intervention uh, of some old male middle-aged gatekeeper. Uh, I think that's great. Uh, you know, I think hip hop did, uh, hip hop now also suffers from being too commercialized, but I think it did a lot of this work uh, of asking the, the great big questions. And, and this to me is the genius of, of American popular culture. It doesn't matter so much what the particular venue uh, being used to ask these questions. There always is some kind of, of new contender, some kind of new vehicle that allows us uh, to, to wrestle with these questions and to ask them in new, interesting ways and, and adjusting and adapting to, to the needs and insecurities of, of, of the people for whom these questions are most urgent. Maya McGrath asks, she says, hello, it's very lovely to hear about your work and life and impact of Stan Lee. A question I have is, have you read Mouse? Even though it's as far from a superhero comic book as it can get, what are your thoughts on both a serious book like Mouse using the graphic novel comic format like Stan Lee's work? Oh, I, so yes, I'm a huge fan of, of Mouse and uh, of, of the whole kind of graphic novel uh, the tradition. That it has, uh, that is kind of, if not birthed, then at the very least helped uh, popularize. Um, graphic novels are so interesting to me, uh, precisely because, and maybe this is one of the things I should have I should have mentioned in in my my previous answer, precisely because they really have become this tremendous uh, venue for for asking and grappling with questions that that a lot of literature. Uh, has sort of abandoned as as a little too weird. Science fiction literature used to do this kind of work uh, in the 60s and the 70s. It too then became co-opted as soon as Star Wars became so massively popular uh, and started taking less and less risks and appealing to larger and larger and larger audiences. And along come graphic novels. Uh, and for a very long time, they were the ones uh, able to ask these questions. I mean, Mouse to me is, is one of the, one of very, very, very few um, explorations or, or meditations uh, on, on, on the Holocaust uh, that manages to avoid a lot of the, uh, of the stifling pieties and, and pitfalls of, of trying to represent such a momentous, unthinkable event uh, in, in an art form. That is such a classic example of, of how these things could be done. Um, there, are, there are a lot of other 
tremendous, tremendous examples. Um, I my only regret, and not to mention, by the way, uh, that this is happening all over the world. Uh, IF from York City is an uh, amazing example of of uh, this coming out of Africa. Obviously, Japan has its whole kind of uh, fair share of 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 manga and like really, really great uh, graphic novels and comic books that are tremendously deep and, and insightful. Uh, my only regret is that I I don't have time to keep up with as much as I would like to. Um, another one of our students, um, Maya, is, is one of our wonderful students, and, and so is Jacob Geiner, who asks, um, this isn't exactly an academic question. By the way, non-academic questions are, are totally fine here. Um, he asks, do you have a particular favorite Spider-Man or other character run or arc that trumps the rest? Yes. Oh, absolutely, I do. Uh, first of all, Jacob, hi. Uh, we could spend not 19 days uh, straight answering this question because this is what I spend much of my time, uh, you know, uh, thinking about. Um, I, I will say this, I, and I mentioned him before a little bit because he continues to astonish me. Uh, the Silver Surfer, not popular, not a character in a major movie, attempted before in a movie, but not one of the big movies uh, prior to the MCU revolution. Um, so, Hold on, I, I could actually show this. This is a show and tell. This is this is the gift that I bought myself to reward myself for finishing um, for finishing the book. This is original artwork by the original inker and illustrator of the Silver Surfer. So this guy right here uh, is Galactus. He is a uh, big celestial godlike creature. Uh, who gets his power from gobbling up uh, the energy of planets. He literally eats plants. Uh, and his emissary, the Silver Surfer, uh, is, his emissary is a Silver Surfer. He uh, one day asks the Silver Surfer to uh, get up uh, and go, or lech lecha in Hebrew, from, from his father's house and the land that he loved, uh, to an unknown location and, and puts him through many, many tests. In other words... The Silver Surfer is in every way, shape, or form an Abraham-type figure. Uh, and just like Abraham, who famously stood up to God and tried to dissuade him from destroying the cities of the plains, Sodom and Gomorrah, the Silver Surfer in the greatest, greatest, greatest comic book arc of all time in history, uh, past, present, or future, um, arrives uh, on Earth just, uh, just before uh, it is scheduled to be gobbled by Galactus. Um, and he has a little fight with the thing uh, of, of the Fantastic Four. Uh, and he ends up, uh, he falls because the thing is very strong. He throws him into, into an apartment and it happens to be the apartment of the thing's girlfriend who is, uh, who is who's blind. And she uh, asks him, well, what are you doing here? And he basically tells her. And she then mounts this, this incredible speech uh, in defense of mankind, in defense of love, in defense of human connectedness, in defense of, of earthly caring. And the Silver Surfer becomes, uh, becomes moved uh, to stand up to, to God, to Galactus, uh, and say, you can't, you can't destroy these people. He, he, he develops a moral consciousness. He develops a moral backbone, and he defies Galactus. And Galactus is shocked and, and eventually grants him, you know, the, this reprieve. I mean, the, the Fantastic Four finding some kind of weapon had something to do with it too. But uh, the, the main kind of drama of the storyline is Abraham standing up to God, is the Silver Surfer standing up to Galactus, is the moment in which you realize the true, uh, the true morality means uh, standing up for an abstraction, for, for, for strangers uh, who you don't know, but whose rights are inalienable uh, and, and, and who, who uh, deserve the dignity uh, that, that is awarded to them as, as creations, irrespective of, of how weak or imperfect uh, they might be. It is such an amazing, amazing, amazing storyline. It's a, it's a three uh, comic book arc. My dog agrees with me completely. It's her favorite too. It's a three storybook, um, it's a three comic book arc and it is um, made even more special and beautiful by the fact that the Silver Surfer speaks. I wish I had a comic book available to read. He speaks in this biblical cadence that is so archaic and flowery and beautiful. And if you can, check it out. 
Um, one of our audience members asks, um, I'm a fairly new Marvel fan and I'm starting to sense a pattern of corporations or governments interfering with the creative nature of com comics to create the current state of Marvel. Would you say this new capitalist and propagandist mindset interferes with the core of the comic industry, that of creation and meaning? If so, can you elaborate on the struggle between modern corporate thinking and religious or philosophical meetings that creators try to put into their work? Yes, and again, I apologize for the hound. Uh, comic books really, really excite her. Um, I, I want to answer this uh, in 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 a in a kind of roundabout way. I, I realize I've spent a bunch of time fulminating uh, about about corporations here, but here's the interesting thing about comic books, and this is the genius of American popular culture. American popular culture does not exist, uh, and and never has existed, and never will exist, uh, in opposition to commerce. Uh, we are not Europe where artists are sort of, you know, state sponsored, uh, you know, fiery prophets who live in garrets and, and write their, uh, you know, searing condemnations of, uh, of breed uh, or, or, or other vices. Uh, these things have always uh, been, uh, in fact, we're very much born as, as total, you know, crass commercial enterprises. Stanley spent his entire lifetime being very much judged by the most immediate brutal metrics. I mean, if a comic book sold really well, uh, then the series was greenlit. Uh, the Hulk, for example, disappeared for a stretch of many, many years because it was introduced and it was just too freaking weird. People are like, wait, he's this green guy who then turns to the other guy and, and he's, it's all about like Cold War anxiety and there's morale. This is too much. We, 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 don't, want to, uh, we don't want a monster as, as, as our leading guy. Uh, not enough comic books were sold, and it took many, many years and, and a lot of, you know, Stan Lee building up credibility with his bosses uh, for it to come back. There's something kind of incredible um, about, about the need uh, to, 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 to sell copies, about the fact that these uh, creations always emanated uh, from commerce that made them be in one and the same time uh, – completely innovative in their ideas and themes, but also deeply, deeply attuned to the very real uh, desires of, of people who, you know, actually paid money for, for this stuff. It, it doesn't exist in, in some outer realm. However, uh, having mounted this, this passionate defense of, you know, the role, positive role commerce could play in art, I will say I think we've reached an inflection point. Uh, I, think, I, I think commerce has gotten so big and, and the corporate uh, infrastructure has gotten so big. I mean, the companies who own uh, this intellectual property, I hate this term with a passion, uh, but it's, it's Disney now, which also owns Star Wars, which also owns The Simpsons, which also owns literally everything else. Uh, and it's just become this great big entertainment complex. On the one hand, it has its advantages. They could make these uh, great big movies that are you know terrific spectacles and they could have great rides, Disney World or, or what have you. On the other, I really do think that the likelihood of them taking um, the sort of even very modestly calculated risk that even a, a lesser stratum of, 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 of corporate uh, inflected uh, creativity might have allowed for, I think that's gone. Uh, I don't think that's coming back. So, so I very much believe that whatever great big innovations we'll see in the future uh, are going to come either through smaller independent publishers or through people who publish you know, primarily online uh, or in, in other art forms that are less susceptible to this vice of, of, of big, big, big corporations. Well, thank you so much for um, being with us today. This was a lot of fun. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure our, our audience uh, agrees that it's, it's made the world of comics come alive a lot more to hear from you. Um, so uh, thank you to our audience um, uh, and to Liel and of course to um, uh, Bud Shorsting, the Shorsting Endowment has sponsored this event um, at, like so many other wonderful events we're having this semester. Um, so have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. And, and La Shana Baba, Florida. May we meet in person very soon. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.